The artwork you're looking at is by Austin-based artist Renee Nunez. She's someone whose work I started looking at in the lockdown period of the pandemic, and I just found it to be so soothing and almost medicinal during that period. And in the years since then, I've just I've, I love it whenever any of her work pops up in my feed. It feels magical. It just it has a quality to it that is kind of hard to put to words. And I'm not really a person who runs out of words very often, so I like it when that happens. So I just had a really good time finally getting to sit down and talk with Renee and finding out what she's all about, what how she approaches her artwork. And um, she was speaking my language in a lot of ways. And um, she dropped some, some really great nuggets of wisdom here and there too. Before we get to the conversation with Renee though, I do want to just quickly say thanks for tuning in. This is a brand new channel. This is the first video. It's a total experiment. And um, I would really, really appreciate any help that anyone out there watching can give with the algorithm by liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and sharing this with your friends and your communities. At the end of this video, I'm gonna give you a sneak peek of the next artist that's coming up in this series, so don't run off right away. And without further ado, here's Renee. So thank you for being here. I'm so excited. Me too, I'm so happy to be here and finally put a face to a name and work. Yeah. So um, for people who, who don't know, which is going to be basically everyone watching this, um, you and I have never met in person, but we've been following each other on Instagram. And I can't remember exactly how I found your account, but I feel like it was like somebody shared one of your paintings in a story or something, which is how I find a lot of people. And um Actually, I was following I you for on you because oh, really? Tammy, um, why am I blanking her last name? That's Ruben. Terrible. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I was with Rubinson for some reason. You were combining Tammy our last Ruben names. Had participated in your postcard exchange. Right. I okay. That's how it happened. That explains why, because I felt like it was just like all of a sudden there was this new person that I was like, who's this person? This this is really <laughs> cool. And then we were like collaborating on stuff and you were in the postcard exchange and I was loving it. So it just kind of was like, um, you know, you follow people and it's and there's sometimes like superficial interactions on social media, right. but but it was like this particular connection just felt like oh a new person and we're like actually connecting in ways outside of just you know liking each other's posts and whatnot right so, um and I have our I pulled these out because I, I wanted to show them off for one thing but also this morning when I was looking at them I noticed that um there's actually like a common theme in them so this is the postcard that you sent oh, right. <laughs> and it's a succulent and you even gave me a little like botany lesson on the back, which I love. <laughs> and, um, cause I love all the sciences, but like, honestly, botany has not been the one that I like have, have dived into. Um, and then this was our other collaboration or, or half of it which right. was like for I can't remember what this was called it was the like the U.S. postal thing when artists were creating artwork and like right sending it through the mail and I think I'm sure it seems like all so long ago but it was because there was like um the threat perceived threat of the post postal service like shutting down like before the election and people were worried that mail-in votes wouldn't be counted and you know is that your memory of that yeah yeah, yeah I mean I mean so much just happens I know like, <laughs> and, and it's still <laughs> rapidly evolving um but I so this project 
was um, like, I painted the background on this one and sent it to you. And then you painted it on top. Right. You also had, had one that was flipped, but my background was like a really blurred prickly pear cactus photo that I painted from. And then you did all these beautiful designs on top of it. So we both did succulents. That's so funny. Our, our paintings, which I thought was cool. So. You don't necessarily do botany, but you have a lot of landscape in your work. It's yeah. Kind of like a more zoomed out perspective. It is. It's more um, like being the feeling of being in nature and then also like geology is really one of the things that I love and so that's why I think I'm drawn to like desert uh, landscapes where you you don't have all the foliage because you yeah. can see the all the layers and the rocks and like all the processes that have happened and it's kind of like this frozen you know still life of something that is still evolving and changing but it's, it looks very static and you know it's like different windows on the same thing yeah absolutely um I mean I feel like I've been drawn to plants more and more these past few years um especially like during the lockdown time you know my I'm here this is my parents house and so it's in san antonio in an area that's like rapidly being developed and Ooh. which has been really hard to watch but um part of that like saving grace was that there's it's it's so it's enough like on the edge that there's really um there's like trails and woods and stuff nearby that i could basically just walk to from here so I was spending a lot of time just like out in the woods, communing That's with trees okay. and whatnot during that lockdown time. Cause it was just, also there was lots of construction around like to the point where they were putting in new roads and the whole house would like shake, you know, like you couldn't get anything done. It was terrible. Um, Oh, that's hard. So I would just like go into the woods and, and I mean, you could still like hear those sounds, but it was so muffled mm -hmm. and um, it was a lovely escape. And I was having a realization of, you know, or a pre an appreciation of trees on a whole new level. Even though I grew up in this area among like all the big oak trees and everything, I grew up in the country, but um and always loved them but it just I don't know I think we all kind of had those experiences in lockdown where like certain things became a little more special I, I've always I'm fascinated about this area that you're talking about because even though I love San Antonio I haven't explored it very much so yeah. I'm really curious about how that because I'm on the Edwards Plateau which is a little bit more rugged than say you know Austin or even what I imagine San Antonio to be like yeah so, but are you like close to the river or not I mean um so no not really close um it's where where we are is kind of on the transition zone between hill country and south Texas plains okay and so um some of those trails that I would hike on which sadly a lot of those don't even exist anymore because they've like bulldozed them but um it was like half of the trail you felt like you were in south texas and it was like mesquites and like clear, uh, cleared areas where you know previously there had been like farmland or something and um so it would like be you know you're in the trees and then there's like a little clearing and it's pretty flat and then there was a there's a dry creek bed and you go through the creek bed and then like on the other side it was just like all oaks and hills you know oh my so god it was really cool actually um wait it's gone it's gone oh. yeah they've um I mean <laughs> oh. 
starting out on a little bit of a downer note here, but yeah, it's, <laughs> um, when I said it was hard to watch, it was really like their, their, their bulldozing giant mature oaks that are probably hundreds of years old, you know? Um, I mean, I still think it's important to talk about. That's why we're absolutely, making the absolutely. art that we're making. I mean, I mean it, I've, it, the same thing's happening here and like, there's like a 500 acre hilltop that you can see from 1431 going down. And it's just like, they did in it like, normally around this area, they would carefully mark the oaks and yeah. stuff that were to stay. And they know they just clear cut the whole thing. And you can see it for miles. That yeah. is just dirt. Yeah, <laughs> it's happening in a lot of places, I think. Um, I mean, it really makes you want to bury your head in the sand. Yeah, I mean, it was it it was very and is very frustrating to watch. It's moved, like where I'm. I don't look out my window anymore and see it. Um, I mean, really, like a year ago, I, I couldn't have done a recording like this because it was just too loud, you know. And that went on for for a long time for like at least a couple of years um yeah I just I don't know if you saw like the some press recently about um some of the state parks in Texas like they're they're fighting for um some land up in North Texas like that some developers have claimed I think it's Lake Fairfield and then down here there's uh, the Honey Creek that is, uh, you know, it's a pretty like delicate ecosystem mm -hmm. area and it was a ranch and the family uh, has recently sold that land to the parks, Texas State Parks Department instead of selling it to developers. And they, I mean, they still made a couple million dollars I think but they could have gotten a lot more and it's so it's gotten a lot of press because of that awesome. yeah that that's particular yeah I know it's like kudos um and thank you yes um that particular area is is more like where I grew up um and so I still know a lot of people who live out there and I was having a conversation with someone from my high school recently that um, this person that I was talking to is, you know, like pretty stereotypical Texan guy from rural Texas, like kind of cowboyish and um, Republican, definitely. And sometimes in the past those conversations when I get up on my soapbox about like bulldozing trees and whatnot like do not always go over well but um, <laughs> but it, it was just like we were totally in sync you know it was uh, and yeah. I that really made an impression on me because um I don't know it was just surprising and maybe I just need to give people more credit but um it is hard in this particular climate that we're in um but it was also I've found similar things like you know learning that like hunters are actually in alignment with this too because yeah. if if they don't have habitat for deer there's nothing for them to hunt <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely it's true the deers are just living in the neighborhood you know yeah. they roost in the yards well they don't and coyotes <laughs> yes well there's no more coyotes I haven't heard a coyote in over a year really and that's that seems to me bad because as soon as the coyotes go then the, you know that there's going to be this they keep things in balance yeah you know? yeah so but that's just now starting to happen. So I don't even, we haven't even seen the effects of that yet. Yeah. Um, I mean, I still hear them every now and then. And I've, I saw a couple of them like on my walks, um, which is very unusual. I mean, to me, that was 
a testament to how much habitat destruction was really going on because they're elusive and unless right. you have like a small pet or something with you like I have I do know a couple people who've like hiked with dogs and coyotes have followed them or whatever but um you know usually they're not gonna they're not gonna mess with humans because they know better um so just the fact that we crossed paths <laughs> was telling I thought like they just they didn't have any place else to go um yeah it's really um I've taken a lot of photos like of all the different stages and and like journaled and I feel like I'm gonna do something with that at some point I don't know what that will be yet I have a couple things ahead of that that I want to work on but um it's in there steeping and brewing and you know that's how it works I mean yeah I mean you probably have like so many journals I'm a I'm an avid journaler um I mean I have journals from before even before COVID so I actually have a whole drawer full of just like journals that um art journals or more personal journals written, just like personal written journals um so yeah I I don't do I've tried to do the whole like art journal thing and I end up trying to control it too much. And so it doesn't, it doesn't flow. I feel like that's, I, I used to work in publishing as a designer and like art manager, art director. And um, I think it comes from that of just like, if something's on a page, I'm going to just like revert to like oh. out and like what is the, my <laughs> purpose like what's the function who's the audience rather than just um getting it on the page you know so they're both valid they methods. are um but it just in terms of like journaling it's not necessarily been the most successful thing for me so do you do that do you art journal I um I, first of all, I'm like, this is like kind of tangential, but I've been like watching people YouTube channel like journals. I'm fascinated because I'm like, I don't understand it because yes, I do journal and I do like do journals about my art, but it was always like I would be writing down ideas and doing little sketches and it was like, it was, it's not pretty. It's just, you know, it was like a way because my head is always full of stuff it was just a way to get it on the page yeah and so I have a bunch of journals like that which I call art journals I didn't even yeah. know about this other phenomenon that was um fascinating but um not I don't do that either but I I do do some either do that or I do lists I write lists yeah I don't, I used to write more personal kind of intimate stuff, but then I just like, I'm not a good writer. I'd go back and read it and just like cringe and want to burn it. Yeah. Well, I don't <laughs> feel like journaling is like, cause I like writing too, but for, to me, journaling is like, um, completely just like raw pouring it on the page. And so it doesn't matter what it sounds like or how it's written, you know? Um, but it is something you can mine later for using in other ways I think I guess in my case I can always collage over it or something yeah do you um <laughs> that's just like my personal writing I actually enjoy going back and reading in my art journals whatever my ideas were I mean a lot of times mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense I'm like mm -hmm. I don't know what I was rambling about but and there was a period in my life when I was actively using ideas that I journaled from, but it's been about 10 years that I, I kind of got out of the habit, I guess, because I just started sketching instead, like doing drawings and stuff. And so I've been doing that lately. So. Yeah. 
your drawings are just like beautiful and just like mesmerizing. So do you know uh, Georgiana Houghton? Do you know that artist? She's kind of in the same, she's that grouped makes... together with like Hilma off Clint's and. No, I don't, but I love Hilma. How do you say that her name? <laughs> I've never known how to say it. Hilma. I might be saying it wrong, both of them. So there was one of your drawings in particular that I pulled off of Instagram. So there was this one. Uh, do you remember that? Yeah, that um, was from the period of our collaboration. Yeah, it was about that time. And then you had some others that like more recent. I don't know when this one was. This is a pencil drawing. Yeah, that one's a little later. Yeah. The, the one with the fish in it is kind of like, that's continuity from my past. But like my watercolors in the past were like that when I did more formalist kind of stuff. But this, yeah, I mean, it's funny that you call that a drawing because I think of it as a painting, but. Yeah, uh, it is a painting. Um, I no, think I was I, thinking of some I, others, but then I started off on the, the Georgiana Houghton thing. And that um, that made me think of that particular painting, but it has a really, like, if you look at her work and then look at that painting it, it almost looks like you channeled her and wow. which is fascinating to me because that's her whole thing just like Hilma she was a channel you know and she does like spirit art or did he's obviously not living anymore but um that, that's really cool I yeah I love all that stuff I I wish I channeled I'm always like am I gonna channel? I mean always I feel like a lot <laughs> a lot of artists are channeling and musicians and creative people and also people who aren't creative I, I just kind of feel like a lot of creativity in general comes from that place even if we don't recognize it you know but you're do you drawing think, do you think that it's that we're always channeling or that we just sometimes channel because I feel like we all have the capability of it but it's sometimes I feel like some work feels really forced and then some oh, yeah. work is just like, whoa, it was so yeah, <laughs> float out. That that kind of work seems to me more like it's channeled. Yeah. I I mean, you could also call it like being in in the flow or whatever, you know. Um it's probably a more um understandable conventional way of talking about that particular experience um of just like things kind of pouring out of you but that's that's how I always when I see your drawings that they feel very mystical and magical and just like like they're Aww. coming from some some other realm you know that is like a place I'd like to visit thank you that yeah. that makes me really happy I mean that's 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 a, a state of being that I seek you know I'm like I'm always interested in you know the other side you know not just like not just trying to go to the other side but experiencing it in our everyday yeah yeah do you feel like that that um does that interest come out do, like in a deliberate way in your work are you exploring some of those themes or I'm not I'm not methodical in that way I don't I feel like if I create how do I put this if I create a state of being or if I create my life that's open to communication with the rest of the world and I mean all the world I mean people you mm -hmm. know necessarily but everything the whole thing communication with all of it plants and animals and universe yeah 
so I hope that, that filters into my work, but I don't like, I'm not deliberately like, you know, asking this tree, you know, right. <laughs> what it wants to say. <laughs> but I don't even know if I'm answering your question, but yeah, I feel like I want to be a conduit for that. Yeah. Yeah. That it's so it's not just the human perspective. Yeah, absolutely. You said something, um, <clears throat> you did an artist talk recently, uh, for women and their work that I listened to. And you said it's something in there about, um, I can't remember how you said it, but it, you were talking about like the worms I view and see oh, yeah. uh, the world, like everything's very large and exaggerated because you're looking at it from from that viewpoint of a tiny yeah. picture. Yeah, I was talking about how, um, I don't know why this is really persistent for me. And I, I mean, probably it's not a popular idea with people, <laughs> but I really think that people need to feel their place in the world and I think that the place that we've sought isn't the necessarily the place that's healthiest for our, our psyches for the environment for anything and I think what I'm hoping is to create that sense of like actual place but it's you know I mean it's a metaphor it's not literal but I feel like it comes from feeling smaller from feeling humble and like you're not in charge of everything like yeah. you're just you're you're a component right yeah absolutely um I love all that I mean I feel like for the landscapes like when I do landscapes I do them I do them in different ways but like I do a lot of plain air work and so that experience for me is kind of what you're talking about it's like um connecting with all of those living parts you know of this giant system that we're kind of just like a little piece of um it's kind of like communing and acknowledging and just being present with that you know that's very grounding for me and honestly more like more and more as the world gets um crazier it's been a real <laughs> um helpful thing for me to be able to just like go and sit and be present in nature in a way that is different from um like photography because I do photography too but it, that starts getting really technical and kind of the same way with like what I was talking about with art journaling it's like a different part of my brain gets activated where I'm trying to control it a little too much um but like those I don't things. I can't even understand how you do but that's like I still can't wrap my head around photography and I've had to do it for decades trying to document my work, but I've never been able to like, don't have that kind of mind. Yeah. I really admire that. I saw the photographs. I don't remember. I guess it was on Instagram. Yeah. On Instagram. Those were so beautiful. Thank you. Um, those I actually took in a workshop because I wanted to learn how to do night sky photography and I wasn't sure like of a lot of the technical stuff. And so I took a workshop out at um, Big Bend National Park that it wasn't through the park. It was like some a photographer that was doing it there. And um, it was really helpful. And that one shot that is in the Terlingua Cemetery has a meteor and I was like yeah. the only lucky person uh, in the workshop who captured that meteor. Uh, and I was so excited <laughs> about it. Um, so I had some coaching on those. Um, and I've done some night sky photography since then. But I, I, like, honestly, 
I just felt like it got in the way for, of the experience for me. Um, like I just, I mean, you can probably tell from a lot of the art that I do is like nighttime scenes and right. that's yeah. like the, the stars in the sky are my happy place, you know? Um, and but also I think when it's like nighttime, the frequency goes down like yeah there's not as much human activity and so i feel like there's less separation between so that makes sense yeah that yeah um i mean there's a part of me that feels like we've we've just really lost something as a species by creating the the level of light pollution that we have to where most of the people on the planet have never even seen the Milky Way or they're, they've seen like just a very um, sad version of it <laughs> because it's because <laughs> there's like a city nearby, like anywhere on the East Coast, um, for sure. Um, I mean, it's not just it's everywhere. It's the whole world. Like if you look at those map, those dark sky maps, um, yeah. just you know, there's a lot of reasons why I am drawn to and love the Big Bend area, but it is a international dark sky protected area. And so it has some of the darkest skies in the whole U.S. And is fairly easily accessible, you know, from here. It's still a drive, right. but, you know. Um, yeah, there's a whole, like you know, kind of what you were saying with, with this miniaturized view of the world and having humility and respect, like there's, there's part of, there's that for me as well in the nighttime stuff, because it's like, there's a whole nother world that comes mm -hmm. alive then. Um, like just the nocturnal activity is sometimes, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I don't know if you camp, I'm a pretty avid camper. And um, sometimes like the night times are not very relaxing because there's critters yeah. that are out like, <laughs> right outside your tent doing stuff and being loud, you know, and um, when you get, you know, I've done it, I'm 51 so I've been doing it for a while. I've lost my fear. I know, I know, um, how to you do solo camping. camping too, or just I do solo camping. Yeah. You're uh, so mostly solo camping actually. It took me a year to get up my courage to do a solo hike. Yeah. I like, still have people say, Oh, you know, you shouldn't do that. It's really dangerous. Oh yeah. People tell me that all the time. I, I mean, yeah, I, I had a little, like I had somebody basically do an intervention with me last summer <laughs> and I was like, this is really about <laughs> you and your fear and what you're yeah. projecting onto me that you think I did that I didn't do because, um, you know, there, there are definitely risks to solo hiking, um, but I also am careful, you know, and I've had, I've had like wilderness survival training. That was something that I, I did because yeah, I knew that I cool. wanted to do more of this. So where did you um, do that? In Austin through REI, they do oh, classes cool. sometimes. So there's, um, I can't even think of what it's called, but it's like over, um, I'm, I'm just like all of a sudden drawing blanks on all of the Austin place names, but, um, well, and I keep interrupting you. So that's not cool. No, it's, it's just, it's fine. That's, that's part of talking. It's talking over each other and jumping in. So I hadn't noticed that you were interrupting me. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to remember the name of it, but it was over on the West side of town somewhere and was a park that I've only been to that one time but there were like waterfalls and stuff it was cool that's so, really cool so yeah. you can't or do you no have that was just a 
like, you know, a half a day training course and it ended up just like pouring, raining on us, um, which is why there were waterfalls, but also that was really helpful because we, we got to have some very hands-on yeah. lessons about like, <laughs> um, safety. If like all of your stuff is saturated, you know, and you're saturated and what do you do? Um, so that was, it was fun. I learned how to make fire from, um, our kindling for a fire using, um, the bark from cedar or juniper trees, which was really like, that's something well, that was coming I in. I thought they were really flammable. They the are. Thing. <laughs> yeah, they are. Um, the, and the bark, like when it's dry, um, it's kind of like you, you can peel it off. I mean, obviously in very minimal amounts so that you're not damaging the tree and even better if you can find a piece on the ground, but, um, it's kind of like, um, like almost like a hairy texture and you yeah. just can like rub it until it becomes like a little hairy fuzzball. And then you, you put that, you build a little cone with sticks, like small, you start small I'm teaching you how to make a fire. Yeah, I love it. No, I love it. <laughs> I don't know how. I mean, I know how to do it in a fireplace. But that's yeah, different. you, you <laughs> like you put that in the center of your little cone that you've made, and then you light that, and then the the small sticks light, and then you you gradually layer on bigger and bigger things. Um, which I already knew that part, but I didn't know I didn't know how to make the little cone, and I didn't know how to do that thing with cedar. So, um, that was fun. I, I always feel like there's a, it's a little point of pride often yeah like when I go camp with people I'm always of the fire course. person I mean if I was a solo camper I'd be bragging about it to everybody it's nice I mean I you know I've been a single mom since my kids were very very small and so I just kind of understood that I was gonna do things by myself and if I wanted to do them I was gonna be doing them solo but it's not like um I mean I think some people would hear that and be like oh but it's really um I love it you know and I'm I'm very selective about who I will camp with too because um like that that kind of that level of quiet and solitude is not something that I get very often and um I can go at my my a pace that is like perfect for me and eat the food that I want to eat and like you know go to bed when I want to go to bed and not have to worry about what anybody else wants to do and it's lovely <laughs> although I do or camp with my kids face with chatter yeah. huh or fill the space with chatter <laughs> right I mean and that's good too like I, I do enjoy camping with friends and stuff too, but, um, but I, I'm protective of my solitude. It's a special thing, I think. And I, yeah. I require it as a human being to function, I think. So. Yeah, that's admirable. Thank you. I mean, um, I, like I said, I grew up in the country and so it, in a way it's like I've been doing that kind of stuff all my life you know um it's not it's not intimidating to me in that way like um it's scarier honestly when there's other humans around because that's yeah. kind of like I don't know who these <laughs> people are and um yeah, that's yeah. that's what my friends say. I mean, I've had I have another female friend who does solo camping or has in the past, and she's like, "Oh no, I'm way safer in the woods." Yeah, I, mean. I feel that way too. Um, I mean, I I don't feel like I'm a fearful traveler in general. Um, I mean, I, I just, I feel like I have fairly good instincts about people and I can 
feel out a situation. I mean, that doesn't mean that I haven't been in situations that I was like, what is happening right now? <laughs> uh, because that has absolutely happened. Um, but I've never, I've honestly never really felt like in danger from other people while I was traveling, you know, I mean, there have been some times where I was like, it's time to, to move on, like, you know, to another location. Um, like this, this person is making me uncomfortable or whatever, but it's, um, I don't know. I just, I feel lucky in that way, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what that, what creates that some, like some people are more fear-based for sure. But is it just that, or is it somewhat environment? Is it something that you decide to do? Like, well, it's drilled into, to us, especially as women to not, you know, do things solo, like travel right. or camp or jog or <laughs> walk in the parking lot at night. I mean, it's just like from the time you're very young, those messages are very loud and for a reason right you know um but i but you never know when you'll be abducted by an alien <laughs> exactly <laughs> i mean which might be preferable to being abducted by a human honestly who knows i mean i'm i'm down for the whole like joyride thing in a in a flying right. saucer and then bring being brought back decades later and it only seemed like three minutes so I would I would be okay with that if I if I didn't know that I would like be completely distraught over missing those decades of my children's lives right. then, um, then I would be totally down for that but you know yeah it always comes down to family I think yeah your people yeah. <laughs> so what do you um like your your work is very nature based um how in in what ways do you feel like you commune or connect with nature outside of your artwork well um the most immediate way i do it is by gardening i'm a gardener so and i um i did that plant thing during the pandemic i don't know why i was just like I feel like plants were just like people were obsessing about that so and then I got all these house plants that I had no business getting so I have a bunch of house plants that aren't doing very well yeah <laughs> I'm better with garden plants so I do that I garden a lot and I'm always interested in and I live near um Balcones Canyonlands the preserve that's uh -huh. just seven minutes from my house and I walk and there's still a lot of nature I mean even though I could still see a little bit of that cut away the hillside that they cut off there's still lots of trees and you know our property is like wild and I don't mow my lawn very often like I sometimes will mow it so I have a lot of things growing in my yard there's like just so much things there's so yeah. many things growing and so I I do it that way mostly are just, you gardening like edible plants like vegetable gardening or more like landscaping kind of xeriscaping kind of stuff or like what is your always, I'm kind of always changing my idea like I started like Cause we just bought this property in like 2017 and I, I planted a, a kidney wood, which is a, that native tree. It's, I think it has some medicinal uses, but I, you know, I haven't had the opportunity or the need to use that. It's but I started kidney out wood? with kidney wood. It's I've like, never even the, heard of that. it's kind of got these feathery kind of lace, almost like a mimosa. And then it has these white, 
spikes and they're they're very fragrant and the bees love them and they're just they're really great in terms for of of supporting the pollinators uh -huh. so i started out wanting to do natives and then i got obsessed with like so i planted a lot of stuff that's like food based like there's some uh native mulberries i didn't even know that there was such a thing that there's a texas mulberry until uh -huh. the birds planted it because then i now i have two of them and then there's a mexican plum which you know i mean a lot of these foods you couldn't subsist on <laughs> but yeah there, there's so many things but people like, did yeah mm -hmm. they did I think we could if we were willing to eat the insects. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I think that's kind of a mental barrier. <laughs> it may come to that. You never know. <laughs> Let's hope not. But have you ever, I, I've had um, crickets before. Have you ever eaten insects? Well, yeah. Are you I'm vegetarian? A, um, I I, I'm not. I'm not a vegetarian. Uh, you'd think so. But I am. Um, I've had chapelinas. There's just yeah. the grasshopper in Oaxaca, which is another thing. Is like every time I go out of town, if I go somewhere, I'm definitely going for the vegetation, like yeah. do a hike, you know, see nature and thing like that. And like Oaxaca is amazing in terms of that. I mean, there's, I mean, there's orchids that grow in in the United States, but you're gonna have to travel. <laughs> Yeah. really far from texas to see yeah. them are they I mean, growing like wild there the orchids? yes yeah, yeah the, they have there's so much that grows there i mean in oaxaca in july it's like the trees are full of like these different flowers and yeah it's so amazing like huge flowers on trees you don't normally think of that like flowers on tree not like they'll be like dogwoods I guess or magnolias but mm -hmm. not much yeah um, so yeah anywhere I go like when we went to um, Edinburgh Edinburgh it was about seven years ago no five five or six years ago we went and I, I just hiked. I didn't go and do any of the traditional tourist things. I just went to do outdoor stuff, going to cemeteries and hikes and gardens and things like that. Yeah. That's, that's always lovely. my primary mode. Driving down the road, looking at <laughs> the stuff that's growing on the side of the road. I always want to know what's there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can appreciate that. I've been to Hawaii a couple of times and, and it's the, it's the same there where the plant, I mean, it's depending on where you are, because right. actually there's some very diverse climates, um, climate zones on the different islands and on a single island even, but like plants are obviously a much bigger thing there than in the desert. This is one that I pulled off of your website. And then also this one, because I know you have a dance background and um, that one photo obviously was something that you did for a dance performance. Is that that's correct? Yeah, I, I collaborated a lot with Kathy Dunhamrick whom I used to dance for in her company mm. and it, it gradually became more of a, a visual like a, my role shifted from being more of a dancer and then to doing art so that one was so it's 2008 and I wasn't in the company anymore but I just had this idea and I'd created this maquette I mean it was this tiny little thing like like where's the camera <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where the camera is 
but it was this cute little maquette with these tiny little hand cut feathers in it. And I was like, oh, this, I think this would be really cool to dance with. And so I, I pitched it to Kathy and she was so game. She's just, she's a wonderful collaborator. She's always given me like full reign, you know? I mean, she'll say, you know, well, this may or not, may not work or this does work, but she has such a wonderful way of being generous in her collaborations. It's just, I, I really, really, really cherished it. Yeah. That's nice. The other one that I pulled up, um, like, I don't think I didn't get the impression that that was like created specifically for any sort of connection to dance, but there's the, the, the flow of how you you hung all of the different pieces like it, it was it has a very clear movement to it that I could see either absolutely there being some sort of performance like in that environment right that isolation yeah. or just that like you know you as um the artists having this background in dance and movement like bringing that quality into your work and even the stuff that's behind you has a lot of like fluidity yeah. and movement going on there that is just like you know like it kind of like I kind of want to start dancing like to <laughs> dancing. and um do you do you feel like that's again something that like you're you're consciously playing with or is it just sort of seeping in I think it's I think it's seeping in I don't mm -hmm. think that I consciously do that it just it's just I mean I'm kinesthetic you know that's I'm kinesthetic and visual I'm probably equally kinesthetic and visual so I think that's a big part of it and that's why I paint big yeah. is because then I can like, I mean, although I love doing small work, you know, with my wrist or the elbow, it's like, it's lovely to just get in there with your shoulder and your, your whole body and yeah. do these big, it's just, that's really freeing. And it is, it does feel like more like dancing, but I also think that, um, you know, growing up, I mean, I've been dancing all my life, so pretty much growing up in the theater and having those those uh, backdrops, you know, tied from the battens, and that was just, I think it, that seeped in, and it's just, I'm not, I think now I'm more conscious that, okay, this is like, I want this to be more like a backdrop or I want this to be something that it's interacted with. But it didn't start out that way. When I did that particular installation you were talking about, that was the first time I had, I had done anything like that. That was, I had done one installation, but they weren't, they weren't interacting. They were just like, I had treated them like objects and they were, discreet that was a the gray duck I think it was like 2010 that's when I started doing that type of work mm -hmm. but when the pieces got bigger then I started to see them interacting and it, I don't it's kind of been a while and I don't remember like exactly how that evolved like I think I was just unconsciously trying to make a landscape. <laughs> yeah. I just but, didn't. But those things are so, the kinesthetic nature of it is so second nature for you. Yeah. And it's just automatic. It, yeah. I mean, I see that and I feel it in the work and it's lovely. I feel like that's an area that, um, just in life not like in my artwork like being more uh, body focused and like 
movement focused is really and I don't mean just in terms of like exercise like I got to get out and you know get in shape or whatever but just like the presence of feeling your body is something that I feel like I'm only now just starting to kind of be like oh like that's kind of cool. <laughs> like I I haven't I've not been like a kinesthetic person other than like the act of painting or something creates like a muscle memory um there's like memory associations with right you know the hand like what I'm creating with my hands but like the full body experience of it is is kind of new for me and I maybe that's why I tuned into it in your work but I think it's really it's really lovely thank you Thank you. I, I feel like I should share one image with you and okay. I, uh, because it kind of goes, ta it talks about that because I did these costumes. Actually, this is a collaboration I did with my brother. He did an amazing costume. Um, and then we collaborated one and then I did one. It was for the Kathy and Hammer at Gantz Company. It's been a while, so I don't, I don't have those photos on my website anymore. My friend Sarah had given me um, this little kit. It's one of those kits you get in a book, a crafting kit. It was um, fashion, like paper doll fashion clothes. It mm -hmm. was like not the dolls. It was just different. There were templates and different papers and stuff like that. And we was really had a great time with that. And she gave, she gave hers to our dance teachers. Mm -hmm. but I, I didn't, I didn't give them, but it was funny because Kathy called at me and she was like, Sarah told me you were doing this. And I loved these, you know, these fashions that you gave us. And then she asked me, can you do these paper costumes? And She wanted them out of paper for the dancers, for the prima dance in them. And I was like, I, it wasn't like that much time. So I was like, my brother is really creative too. Uh, so I was like, oh, please help me with this. Cause you know, I had to do three. And um, so the one I did was like, I think that I was thinking about cupcake because she had this, um, bodice I made this bodice and it it was uh, like accordion pleated mm -hmm. around the bodice it was out of paper and then I had done this it was a tutu I wanted to do a tutu but it wasn't it was it was flat it was just like a flat two-dimensional like donut tutu it wasn't like dimensional yeah but then it had these paper um spirals coming down off the bottom so that gave it that fullness that you might expect from a tutu but it wasn't wasn't really I mean, she had this cute I put these paper polka dots all over her um they were bloomers maybe they were shorts I don't know they were bloomers but it was just it was just really a really really sweet project to work on and my brother did um his were this like ravishing red spirals, kind of like more au couture and less um, whimsical, but this, and it had peacocks, peacock feathers all over the bodice. And it's just like, just like something you might see on a runway more, but really, really, really beautiful and sensual yeah so we just had a blast <laughs> yeah working that on sounds that. cool and so I've always enjoyed those projects working with Kathy and so yeah just it seemed it seems like it's just a, a natural thing to for those two things to interact like that 
Yeah. I love that. I mean, I, I feel like cross pollination in general in life um, is important. And when it shows up in like artwork, I get excited about it, you know? Um, so yeah, I like, I love that you're, you're doing that and it's part of it, even if it's not really an, an intentional thing always. Um, it's cool. This was lovely. And I feel like our next step is actually meeting in person at some point. Yeah. Um, that would, that'd, that'd be, be great. Um, and I don't know, is there anything else you want to say before I like cl close and no, it's just, I'm so glad that you asked me to do this. I so glad to meet you. Cause I feel like, you know, we've had this connection and now it feels, you know, more real. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe. She's really cool. I had so much fun. Thank you, Renee. Thank you to all of you who watched. Like I said at the beginning of the video, any help that you can give to get some traction with this little project is going to be greatly appreciated. And the best way to do that is going to be to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and to share this with your communities. So coming up next, I'm going to be talking to Scott Winterrode. He is a, an artist that I have had the pleasure of calling a, a good friend for a very long time. He's has decades of museum work in his pocket. He is a very avid watercolorist and we get into some really meaty conversations. Um, one of the things that he features in his artwork is mushroom clouds from some of the atomic bomb test sites. And so with the timing of the, the movie Oppenheimer, I felt like that was going to be a really great place to start in our conversation. And, and, uh, and we get in there. Uh, he's incredibly knowledgeable, and I always love talking to him. And I want to leave you with a little sneak peek. And I hope you will be back for the full video when that's posted. Thanks. Despite the fact that we use these things against humans twice, um, we've used these things against humans many, 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 many times. There was a, a New York Times article just a few weeks ago that talked about the weather patterns and how the distribution of the, the Trinity test and then later, of course, the uh, distribution of the 30-something other tests that occurred in Nevada um, and how weather patterns carried those, mm -hmm. the around the United States so right. and and again the weather patterns and the way that they showed up on the map they look like watercolors like somebody had dropped these purple <laughs> violet hues in the midst of yellows and ochres and other things and let them just run on their own I mean they were absolutely beautiful and then absolutely devastating at the same right. time